So no shit, there I was. It was barely the crack of dawn, like, like not even 10.30 in the morning yet. It was, the, 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 the smell of burned coffee was still wafting down the halls from the break room. Developers were getting out of the scrum meeting calls in the morning, and it was right about then when it happened. The Food Network website was down. Now, the, we manage quite a few other websites, and this was like our largest. Like 100 million unique users, hundreds of millions of page views. So this site being down was a big deal. So we immediately grabbed some couple of engineers, threw them on, looking at what was going on. Now right away it was apparent the site itself wasn't actually down. That was a bit of an exaggeration. No, it was recipe pages. Well, this is almost worse because if you're going to Food Network, you're typically going to look at recipes. And Food Network's uh, you know, website is ad-driven. And all of the... Um, most of this is all ad-driven. So if we don't have people coming, if we don't have people seeing some of the pages, then we're not making any money. And all of those ad impressions are all pre-sold. And if we don't uh, turn out the, uh, the expected number of pages, then somebody's got to get a refund. And I don't want that coming out of my paycheck. So we're doing some digging into that to try to find out what's going on. And then the pages themselves are not actually down. It's really only part of it. The pages are sort of corrupted. All right, let me tell you a little bit about myself first. So I'm Brian Saylor. I'm a, I've spent a lot of years working in the uh, software development field. So I've worked at some uh, startup companies. I've worked at the government. Um, and about 18 years back, I kind of fell into working with the uh, media business. So I started out working with EW Scripps down here in Knoxville. Um, eventually moved over to Scripps Networks, uh, then to Discovery. Um, so I hope everybody is familiar with all the Discovery brands of sites and channels. And of course, as of uh, a few weeks ago, Warner Brothers Discovery. So now the, the list of websites and applications and mobile apps and things like that that I'm working with are going to grow up uh, exponentially again. Working with these, typically I'm working more with, um, I've been doing the uh, uh, leading software development. I've been the software development manager. Uh, I've been overseeing multiple teams of software developers. Um, uh, mostly I work with automation now. But who cares? That's just me. So let's get back to our story. So we're looking at recipe pages. Why are the recipe pages messed up? So not all the recipe pages are messed up. It's maybe one in 10. And we start digging into those. And it comes clear after a little bit that it's the comments and ratings pieces, um, the modules, the, all, all these websites are all modular, right? And they've got different services feeding different parts of them. And the comments and rating systems is not just missing. It's sort of, it's messed up. The things are all broken, uh, which just makes for a bad experience. So we call the community team who manages all of that, right? All of our things are split up. We've got teams handling search, teams handling the community pieces. We've got a team handling uh, content delivery. Community team looks into their things and nothing's wrong. So there's, there's no errors on our side. We've got our system's not sending any, any bag problems, nothing's, nothing the monitors have tripped anything, there's no alerts. It's not on our side, it must be on your side. So our engineers are still digging into this. What's going on? So we start taking the actual requests that are coming in, the server-to-server -server requests that are coming back with those individual things. And this time, by this time, it's now 20% of the recipes. Right? It's getting worse. 
So as you pull out one of those, re those calls, right, there, there's error handling for things like response code. Is the, we're clearly getting 200 response codes because that would get trapped. And it was, there's special handling for that kind of stuff. It's not timing out. Again, that would get trapped. And we have special ways of handling that kind of stuff. The comments are just like not going to show up. No, what we find is what we're getting back from this system that returns JSON, uh, this JSON endpoint, is an HTML page, which then tells us that, hey, this site may not be safe. It's not categorized. Are you sure you want to proceed? Where is this coming from? Right? This is, this is, this is between two of our in internal company services. And yet there's an HTML page. It doesn't come from their system. It doesn't come from our system. Where is it coming from? Well, as probably some of you have figured, this is some sort of, this is a security system intended for employees and checking the sites that they're going to and checking that they're in, in, the, in category, categories that are okay. But in this particular case, it was triggering on internal um, service calls you know, that, are, that are all internal to the, to the company. So we didn't work with the security team. We got it straightened out eventually um, and then had to flush all the recipe pages again because we were caching the bad responses. But you can imagine these developers had now spent a number of hours tracking down a problem that wasn't part of any of their systems. No one knew where it had come from. Eventually we got back to it, but the, you know, we, we're, we track like per minute, like when, when sites are down and when, when we're not able to deliver our content to our customers. And in this particular case, something went wrong. Okay, not the end of the world, we dealt with it, but it was annoying. So let's talk about another story. So one day, I'm working with, um, I'm just doing my regular stuff, working on my computer, doing email. And my system, my computer starts getting really slow. Eventually, you start digging into it, there's a process running. And it's, it's camping on one of the CPUs, burning 100% of the CPUs on my Mac, huge amount of memory. Uh, fine, I don't know what it is. I kill it. Great, everything's good again. For about 30 minutes, process spawns back up again. Camps on the CPUs, everything's slow. Kill it again, well, of course it comes right back. Start asking, starting around the, the development engin and engineering groups. A couple of people reporting the same thing, but only a few. By the next day, everybody was having the problem. Everybody's computer was suddenly super slow. Um, so like, so take uh, design, uh, our UX designers, right? They're running Photoshop and they're creating mock-ups of pages that are gonna get uh, implemented by the development teams. They're creating uh, image assets. And Photoshop is suddenly taking super long to do anything, right? So things that would normally take them 30 minutes are taking them an hour and a half or two hours to get done. Uh, engineering and, and quality assurance are all being impacted. Now, a few people are on Windows machines and they're not having a problem, but most of the team is all on Macintoshes and, and they're all being impacted. So what was going on? Because we couldn't get rid of the software. In fact, we did track down what the software was and we uninstalled it and 24 hours later, it reinstalls. So this was, this was security software that was, you know, so we, you know, I reached out to our desktop support team, walked through this problem with them, and they confirmed, yes, this is, this is security software that's intended to check for somebody's computer getting compromised and to notify them that, you know, something's wrong. But wh why, why is it sitting there and chewing up uh, the, the, you know, all the CPU resources and all the memory. Start working with the security team. They reach out to the vendor. Uh, the vendor promises a fix. 
So eventually, you know, so we, there's going to be a fix. It's going to be in the next Friday that's going to roll out. This has now been a problem for two weeks. Friday rolls out, the fix rolls out, and it doesn't make any difference. Now, another thing we noticed while this was going on is that the, it's writing to the disk. And it's writing several terabytes a, a day. And these are all SSD drives on these Macs, right? So they've got like a lifespan maybe of seven years of normal usage. But you suddenly start writing terabytes of data day after day after day, you know, suddenly that may kick, you know, die after a year or two. Who's going to pay for the, the replacement? Um, you know, we missed our, uh, you know, sp the development teams missed their, their deadlines, right? Because everything is taking so much longer, right? Or they're putting in extra hours to try to finish things. Still no word, you know, on, on how we're going to fix this. Eventually, again, continuing to work with their desktop support team, they eventually walked through exactly how to disable the software, not uninstall it, but just have it not run. Because if you uninstall it, right, the this, this software management software will reinstall it. Yeah. So we worked around it. We went through and we provided those instructions to everybody and they, they, they got it off their machines. Now there was probably a really good reason to have that software doing what it was gonna be doing, but it was certainly not working and it was a huge inconvenience and it was certainly ch making everything difficult to do. Here's another, another item. So we have a design team who's building prototypes. Um, so they're building sort of an interactive prototype for some, you know, new uh, update to one of our products. And they're about to be presenting it to the vice president. They, they've been working on this for a while. This is a little, um, it's, it's still static pages, but, they're, but the links on the pages work. So you can kind of navigate between the different pages of the, of the application, kind of makes it semi-interactive. It makes a really nice way to walk through a prototype. Uh, about an hour before their presentation, they came to get me. For the last hour, they've been trying to get it to work, and it had, the whole thing had stopped working. Been, been working for days. They've been working on this prototype for two weeks now, and suddenly it doesn't work. None of the none of the things they click on do anything. And they've been trying for an hour. They can't figure out what's going on. They come down to me. I look at it. Does anyone want to wager a guess what happened? DNS, good, good try. No, no. Windows update. Windows update. Ooh, I can tell you some stories about that. Yeah, in the middle, in the middle of a website launch. Yeah, that's a good time for a Windows update. No, no. Someone's come on. Somebody's got a. All right. Well, you dig into again. This the, the prototype is making making calls, right? Uh, to a back end to, to pull down the static pages, right? Uh, it pulls a little payload and substitutes this all. It's all um, um, in a React framework or something. The same thing, right? Th those pages are getting intercepted and are being replaced with, are you sure you want to proceed? This site's uncategorized. It was working yesterday. It was working the day before. Why today and why right before the presentation is that happening, right? I had to give them the bad news. Like, I, I can't do anything about that, but I can tell you who you can reach out to and maybe they can help. But, you know, at this point, it's 30 minutes to the presentation. You know, I, I think they wound up having to call off the presentation, which they had set up. Eventually, they got it straightened out. They worked out something. But you can imagine the stress those engineers were under trying to get something to work and then finding out that it didn't have anything, everything, they, they were sure they broke something and they didn't. Mm, let's, um, let's talk about a different team. Um, we had a, 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 um, a video streaming team 
that was building products for uh, streaming, uh, basically TV everywhere stuff. So a lot of people were using that for second screen and they had built this stuff off so you can run it to, uh, through a Roku, run it to your television. Um, this is streaming version. This is, this, at this point, this is not necessarily actually like Discovery Plus streaming or that kind of thing, but the precursor to those. So they've been working on those things for, you know, the past nine months. And they, they were going to set up a, a bank of TVs now in the office. So they, they brought in three televisions, they set them up, and they just need to install the application. Okay, so there's a HETV application and a Food Network application and a Travel Channel application. They just need to install them. So those come off of a store site where they get installed from. But the installation doesn't work. On any of the TVs, the installation doesn't work. They spend hours and hours trying to figure there's a networking problem, there's something going on. You know, they couldn't figure out what was good. They just couldn't reach the store. Well, this, this actually was actually the same problem, right? Is that basically it was categorized as games, and so it couldn't reach, right, the, the, the Apple store or the, the, you know, the Samsung store, whichever, you know, wherever it was they were going to to, to uh, install their applications from, were all being blocked. Meanwhile, they'd spent the entire day trying to figure out what was wrong. They reached out to the security team, which were, which were helpful. They were like, ah, we understand what's going on. We can, we can help with that. You know, give us the MAC address of the televisions and we can get in exceptions for you. At this point, the engineers are like, I don't know what the MAC address is and I can't figure out how to get the, 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 the television to show it to me. What those engineers wound up doing was taking all those televisions and taking them home and setting them up and then bringing them back to the office. It's fine. Problem, we'll work around it. Okay? Meanwhile, they spent the entire day working on something and then the end result was somebody is making my job difficult and I will just go take this home and do it. Now, again, eventually this kind of thing was sorted out so that, you know, in later, you know, months later when they were doing more of these, they had a way around that, right? But again, developers are suddenly having to work around <laughs> problems that are making their job difficult. Let's try something else. Does anyone know if Big Al has been moved out into the Knoxville Zoo yet? Out of his winter quarters? I don't know. Uh, it's interesting if you ever get a chance that the, a 400 pound uh, Aldobran tortoise being moved from uh, out to his enclosures is an interesting uh, thing to do. Apparently it takes a lot of patience. <laughs> but we're talking about a shell. Um, so another team that, uh, that worked on internal applications around linear, right? So they're, um, they're building things like transcoding and uh, taking raw footage, converting it over to stuff that gets sent out to uh, internet or to satellites or to like, you know, there's lots of different formats and lots of editing things that happen, but there's systems that, that, that manage all of that. Some of those sit on uh, computers which have graphics cards on them because it uses the GPU. So they're basically PCs. Right? So they had a problem at one point where their monitors kicked off and saying that none of the assets were, were, were stuck at a certain point in the pipeline and they were not moving up through the pipeline. So they began investigating what went wrong, this thing's been working for five years, suddenly something's wrong, they're digging through it. What they eventually found is in the, the in the shell and the um, SSH config had been modified. There was a bunch of lines being added for servers that they had no idea what they were, but a bunch of servers and the keys to access them and things like that, and like, we don't know what these are, and they're suddenly in our, and they're right, written on top of our configurations and, and what they use to move assets between servers 
using you know, SSH and SCP suddenly broke because these lines of code were stuck on top of it. Now what this was was an was, uh, uh, attempt at a honeypot. Right, so they of course, you know, like, I don't know what these servers are, let's go access them and see what they are. Maybe they're part of our stuff or something. And of course then they triggered it. So and that was a great idea, right? The idea, the idea was to, to leave things on people's computers showing access to different um, systems in the company um, that are actually just there just to get you to go there. And if you go there, right, then, then, that, then they know your computer's compromised and then they come down and, you know, with guns and things or something. But in this case, right, I mean, while well, it's a great idea, right, no one knew about it. Um, and no one was test had, you know, tested that this was working with, with different things, and it was overriding uh, you know, configurations that were being used. Now, some end users may have been infected, right? but then they just found that they couldn't get to one of the systems that they were supposed to work on, and they eventually figured it out and fixed it. This was not a common problem, right? You, they, you roll this out on a thousand computers, and but why this computer? Why, why this one that was part of uh, you know, an automated system? Why it was rolled out to that one when it was intended to be uh, employee computers? Um, not, not sure. But meanwhile, again, one of the production system was, was offline for a period of time. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Um, I had a, a team that was responsible for doing maintenance and quality assurance on some of the applications. Uh, and there was a third party uh, group that needed to swap out one of the libraries used on some of our websites. And our quality assurance group wanted to make sure that, that when they changed that out, that that wasn't going to break anything. So the only way to do that was to put it on the website and try it. Um, and for whatever reason, they couldn't really put it on our test systems. They couldn't, just, they couldn't upload the asset because the asset wasn't actually on our server. So fine, use a, use a proxy system like Charles Proxy and you know, substitute it out to pull the library from somewhere else. Um, unfortunately, we had some product people and some other people that wanted to use it. They weren't really familiar with how to do that. You have to set that up for everybody. Great. I was managing stuff at the time, like, you know what, I can just create a little proxy, you can just overwrite their host file, send it to there, and then that'll send you right up to foodnetwork.com and just swap out that one file and just pass everything through. Wrote that up in an hour or so. They were, you know, they were able to use that, solve the problem. But the next day I came in and that server it was down. I'm not, whatever, well, I just restart it. And the team hadn't had a chance to use it yet, so they, they, were, they still were going to be using it. And I come in the next day, and it's down again. Well, that's weird. So at this point, I started digging into that and found that somebody was hacking it. Like, it, it was under attack. I mean, you know, this is a dead, simple proxy. I mean, you can't, it won't proxy just anything. You, you, it would only proxy to the, our one website, and only if you had the, the right host headers, and only... Um, but somebody was passing uh, things, trying to attack that website, th that proxy directly, which was crashing because they didn't know what to do with it. And like, not, like, I don't have host header, doesn't match, nothing, I don't know what to do with it. So I tracked down the IP address where I was coming from. I am figuring like somebody's, somebody's computer in the, in, the, in, the, in the company has been compromised. So let's track that back and I'll go notify people. And I traced it back to somebody in the security organization. The security team was hacking one of my systems. Oh, okay. Um, so for a brief moment, I considered hacking them back. I decided that probably wouldn't end well. Um, and really, I didn't have the time either. So uh, what I did is I, I, just, I just updated the application so that it ignored any requests it didn't know how to handle and just dropped it. And that solved the problem. So now they could hack it all they wanted and it would just ignore them. <laughs> but it was still annoying. <laughs> I 
All right, so let's, uh, I could talk for another three hours about stories like these. And like, catch me later and I can share a bunch of ones. Some of them are funny, some of them are sad. Um, but let's talk more about why. What is the goal of security, right? The security groups in, in your company are focused on protection, right? Protecting the company assets, you know, the data, customer PII, things of those nature, about reducing risk, reducing the risk that assets or data being compromised or misused. Now, in software development, they're about delivering products and data to customers, right? About making new and improved products and pushing it out on a rapid schedule. They're, they're, they're tasked often with innovation and coming up with new ways of doing something, how to do it faster, how to do it cheaper, how to come up with some way to meet this customer's need that we can't figure out how to do. So you've got, on one side, we've got the, the desire to limit risk, uh, limit access to our assets, limit access to the data. And then you have another group in the company who is trying to share our assets and share the data to the customers because that's what we're getting paid to do. That's where the company is making their money, right? They're dry, the, the, the software development group in most cases, not in all cases, are driving, um, the company value, right? This is the product the company is selling to make money, or it's the data that they're selling, or whatever, right? And that puts these two groups at odds, right? One of them is trying to, you know, limit access, and one is trying to push access. And if we stop the one group from pushing that access, we don't make any money, and then the company goes out of business. So who's the bad guy here? Is it the software, uh, you know, is it the security teams? I mean, I've worked with a lot of security people one-on-one -on -one, and they are great people and they are interested in protecting the company. Is it the software development team who is, um, that is uh, continuing to de develop and push boundaries and are in some cases creating some of the vulnerabilities that the security team is trying to patch up. They're good guys too. They are trying, they, what they are doing is what is allowing the company to make money. So really, I mean, really there isn't any bad guys here, right? They are just two groups of people that are, that are trying to, to do their jobs and they're, they're in conflict. So what can we do to help? How can we make this better? So I've got a couple of points I'd like to talk about. So let's start with number one. I'd like you to think first. What could go wrong? Who could be impacted? Right? Identify those things. Whatever change you're making, whatever system you're putting in place, somehow that can go wrong. Who would it affect when it does? How bad would it be? Okay? Can we test it? How do we validate it? How do we, how do we check for the ways it could go wrong and make sure that's not happening? Can we put it in standby mode? Can we put it into a, uh, use beta users, beta testers in different groups to try it out? Um, can we um, recruit people to actually do testing? Because having the same person implement something, do the testing, usually always works poorly. And that's something we learned in software development long, long ago, right? The developer, you don't want the developer testing it. But what we see in a lot of cases in, is, that, is that that same thing's not being applied in other cases. Recruit some people to help test that can look at it from the outside.
communicate. And let's be honest, this has got to be the hardest piece of this. Let people know what changes are coming. Let them know what the impacts could be. Right? What are the potential problems? Who to contact when it happens? Those things bring the other groups in and let them feel like their, their problems are understood. Right? Instead of things being dumped on them and them having to deal with it. Right? Just knowing about it ahead of time, so when it comes up, they're like, you know, this could be that thing that, was, that they said last week was rolling out. Right? But again, of these three, I'd say communication is probably the, the most difficult. It always is. And I work for a media company. So I think it goes a little, so let's go a little beyond that. What I, what I want to see is the security groups and the software engineering groups work as partners, right? Help them with training, help with understanding problems, communicate with them, recruit those people in to help test, identify super users in those groups and go, hey, we're going to make a change. Can we roll it out to a select people first? Have them try it out. And then when something goes wrong, can we roll it back? Right? If the teams are working together and partnering on it, things will go much, much better. Because when, when, is, when security or any other sort of thing is imposed on a group from the outside in an authoritarian manner, those groups try to fight back against it or they try to work around it, right? And, the, and, and, and what they're doing to work around it just makes those security vulnerabilities worse, right? The people that really care, the, those, those engineers that cared about security vulnerabilities start trying to work around the stuff because they still have to get their job done instead of trying to do it well and trying to integrate security in the right way because they're like, fine, some people are just smashing us with this I've seen a lot of conference talks where people stand up and, and talk about their individual use case and how that must solve the problem for everybody. So let's just stop here and just point out that that's not the case here. Everybody's situation is different. Okay, um, in many of the in some of the companies I've worked at, right, delivering products quickly, right, the, we measure the time from ideation to the time that it is um, delivered to the end user, right? And we deliver, you know, measure that like in hours, right? Once a product person says, this is what I want to do, and, and when is it actually on the, that application in the customer's hands, right? In the past and in other companies, right, that's measured in months. You know, if you've got a three month turnaround time, um, you've got plenty of time for things to go wrong and, and to get it fixed and things like that. But when, when developers are getting pushed to like, we're expecting this new change you're working on today to be in production tomorrow, a four hour delay throws everything off. But like I said, it depends. If you're, are you working in a financial uh, institution, in the military, in something like, hey, we can, we can, we can, we're fine with a much slower pace and we want to and can prioritize the security over that. So just you know, bear those in mind. All right. I'm going to do one more story. So I had moved out of doing software management and into working some other things. I was doing DevOps and working on automation and other things of that nature. Um, but the security teams had reached out to the development organization for these websites that we were uh, managing and asked for some help. And uh, while I wasn't managing the software development at the time, um, they asked if I would step in because, you know, I got along well with security people and, you know, I could probably best understand what it is that they were asking for and figure out what we needed to do to help them. 
So they want to talk about web application firewalls. Ah, yes, WAF. Familiar with it. Um, we've actually got, uh, at the time, we had uh, our own custom version sort of built into our applications. We kind of home built. Worked pretty well. It's not the same thing as having a professional product, though. Um, I had uh, uh, pitched rolling out uh, our, um, you know, one of the high-end uh, uh, firewall systems with our system before. We ran it through management, and they were not comfortable with spending the money at the time. Okay, fine. So I let our, you know, security engineer know all this kind of stuff, and they're like, "Well, we want to use this one." You want to use this, this uh, web application firewall. Actually, it's exactly the same one I wanted to use, but myself. So that's awesome. But I wasn't able to sell the cost on it last time. They're like, no problem. We've already paid for it. OK, well then, I, just, <laughs> I, can, I can sell that now. So what do you want to do? Like, we want to know how to work with you to roll this out. OK, well, let's talk about a plan. Um, can we uh, provide some training to some of the engineers in the, in the group and some of the quality assurance people to how to work with it, how to test it? Great, we can do that. Let's set that up. All right, how do we actually roll this out? How do we test it and validate it? Let's make a plan. So worked with him, uh, laid out a plan to uh, change a configuration that would affect, not affect our production systems and allow some people to go through and just make sure that just directing the traffic through the web application firewall would not have any bearing, right? Because they're like, oh, no, it won't make any difference. Like, it'll just go through this WAF and won't do anything. It'll be turned off. But we've made a change. Something could go wrong. Let's test it. Let's make those changes and then test it. And if that works, now we can go ahead and push that up to, the, uh, up to uh, production and then we can put the web application firewall in standby mode. So it'll just execute its rules and log anything that it said it would have blocked or something like that and just make a big log of them. Let that run for a couple weeks. Now let's have some engineers go look through that and look for stuff that should have been, that needs to get let through, right? Things that were, our biggest fear with these is that it, it, it triggering on legitimate traffic that just looks really suspicious. And, you know, we certainly have plenty of cases where we've written stuff that looks suspicious to ourselves. <laughs> Great, they were fine with that. Um, and then once we've gone through that, find any issues, um, work with the security team to help put the, modify those rules to fix it, go back through the process again, check it again. When it rings all good, then push it to production. And that was the process we went through, and it worked great. Um, Engineers were happy, the site was good, we, we put a new level of security in place, um, the security team helped us out. But this was an example now of partnering with the two teams together. All right, I'm going to end on that note. <laughs> but like I said earlier, I have lots of other stories. You can come catch me later if you want to hear about more about like, uh, you know, me, uh, uh, the security team getting mad at me while, uh, trying, while I was trying to stop uh, an active security breach or, uh, you know, the, or, or what I might have had done to uh, re retaliate against the security team for the, uh, them hacking into my systems. Oh, I'm that. Let's hear it. All right. So thank you. And I just want you all to remember that I hate you all. <laughs>